welcome Dr. David Feingold, the president of Chatham University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the United States. Dr. Feingold is a scholar and educational entrepreneur who's dedicated his career to education and training reform, defining high performance, or, sorry, designing high performance organisations and international comparisons of skill creation systems and performance. As well as extensive professional experience, Dr. Feingold has authored or co-authored seven books and monographs, including Are Skills the Answer? Very relevant to our theme. He's provided policy advice on skills issues to the OECD, as well as to the US, Australian, Canadian, Singaporean, Indian, South Korean and British governments. He was an Atlantic Fellow and Policy Advisor to the Leach Review of Skills in the UK. Please make him welcome. Thanks very much, Lee, and thanks all for, for coming out this morning. Uh, I have to be honest, when I got the uh, invitation from Craig and Jen to take part in this conference, it was a, a deep honor uh, to be invited, but I was also a little bit nervous um, because while I've spent my entire career looking at the issues that we're here to talk about uh, these few days, thinking about uh, skill development systems in different countries and how they relate to changes in the world of work, changes in technology and the global economy, um, over the last couple of years, since I went over to the, the dark side of full-time academic administration, um, as a university president, I have a lot less time to think about how are China and India's skill systems evolving and managing to educate millions more people than they were just a couple of decades ago. And I spend a lot more time thinking about how to keep a university that's about to celebrate its 150th anniversary uh, running and up to date and making sure that it's able to succeed with all of the challenges that we see here today. And so I thought perhaps the value that I could add to our discussions is to approach these issues from the perspective of somebody who is a leader of a higher ed institution and is grappling with all of these issues and also to offer a little bit of a historical perspective. And so one thing that I think is a little reassuring is when I look back, and obviously I have not much hair left, but what's left is pretty gray, um, but even before I was born, um, we were dealing with these issues about technological change and what did it mean for education, and was education failing to prepare us for this next wave? If you go back to the 1950s, with the launch of Sputnik, we had the war for space, and President Kennedy in the US declared that the US had to be the first to put a man on the moon, and to do that, we had to invest deeply in STEM education, one of the first times that we saw that focus, science and engineering, if we were gonna catch up to the Russians and, and beat them to, to colonize the moon. Um, and sure enough, that focus on STEM has stayed with us ever since. If you fast forward a generation to the 1980s, we had a seminal report, A Nation at Risk. This time, the, the enemies were different. It was Germany and Japan who were seen for the US, for Australia, for the UK, that their superior uh, manufacturing systems, lean production, and their skills base was going to destroy the manufacturing base in our economies if we didn't upgrade the skills system. What we kept, though, was the Cold War rhetoric. So that ended with the famous quote that the US has, in effect, been committing an act of unthinking, unilateral, educational disarmament. If we fast forward further, we think about the major technological revolution that is connecting all of us globally, that is uh, enabling the creation of whole new businesses, virtual romances, creating lots of challenges in terms of how does government try to regulate this sector. I'm speaking, of course, of the telegraph, created back in 1837, which itself uh, gave rise to a whole set of innovations, as Sand Standage pointed out in the Victorian internet. So what I wanted to do in my remarks was focus on just four of the 12 themes that we heard yesterday from Stephen Morg Morgatroyd, who was talking about technological change, demographics, climate change, and global instability, and what do those things mean for us as leaders or practitioners in the education and training system. So to start with the first of these, 
technological change, I want to talk about two different types of artificial intelligence, which I see as among all the technological changes, the one that has the biggest long-term implications for AI. Now, my, the, our next speaker, Charles, knows far more about this than me, so I'll be brief, but I think we can think about two different types of AI. One I call Go, GoFi, or good old-fashioned artificial intelligence, and this is basically taking what we've always done with computers in terms of being able to write programs and then crunch the data on hardware and making it that much faster as computer power has grown dramatically and lowered in price with Big Blue and more recently Watson. And so what that's meant is computers are now able in any situation where you have a narrow rules of a game to outperform humans. We had it in chess, we had it in Go, we had it in a popular general knowledge game, Jeopardy, in the US. And most recently, just down the street from us at Chatham at Carnegie Mellon, we had the best poker players in the world being beaten by a computer. What's a little scary about that, of course, is unlike the other games, poker, you not only need to know the odds and the strategy, but you also need to be better at lying than your opponent or bluffing. So computers can now outlie us as well. Um, the other type of artificial intelligence, though, is the one I think that has more far-reaching implications for us, namely machine learning. And in machine learning, computers are now being able to do things that many of us take for granted. So going to catch a cricket ball or looking at two similar images and being able to distinguish between them which one is human, which is not. Those are things we do without even thinking how we do it, and yet they've proven very difficult for machines to do historically. But now, scientists are building their own neural networks for computers so that they are able to solve these kinds of problems. And today, computers are, out per able, are able to outperform the best doctors in the world at detecting cancer from a scan. Right in Pittsburgh, where, where I'm based, we now see the, the, the epicenter of the, uh, the driverless car revolution with Uber and Argo AI and others all competing to see who will be the first to commercialize this technology. Well, again, what's making that possible is the tetrabytes of data that these cars are gathering every single day when they go out on test drives, feeding it in so that the machine teaches itself and gets better and better and better. Still, though, these are only AI in relatively narrow implications. We're still quite a far way away from the general AI that would be truly disruptive. But if we think about all of the different elements of technological change together, um, I think they spell really interesting implications for work and education. So I'd like to cite a, a chapter that uh, Stuart Elliott did in a book colleagues and I edited just uh, uh, last year for Oxford University Press. Um, and in it, Stuart compared all of the research that's now going on in companies, in universities, in government labs, and he said, I'm not interested in any sci-fi or speculation, just this work, if it makes it to the market by 2030, if it's commercialized, what will it mean if we compare it with a detailed analysis using BLS data of all of the tasks that are performed in the US labor force? And his co conclusion was, roughly 60% of all of those tasks will be better done by computers by 2030. Now that doesn't mean 60% of jobs will be eliminated, far from it, because as we heard yesterday, jobs are a bundle of a whole complex set of tasks, so hopefully what it will mean is a lot of the more routine stuff will be automated away and we'll be able to focus on the more high value added stuff, but I do think it's going to have severe implications for displacement and thinking about what do we do to prepare people for this coming skills age. So I think it's natural to ask, given this historical perspective, is anything different this time around, this tech revolution from the prior ones? Well, I think there are a few big differences. One is, in each of the prior ages, when we went from agriculture to manufacturing, manufacturing to services, services to high tech, the answer was always, if we move up the educational ladder, if we have higher levels of education, more going to university, colleges, polytechnics, we'll be better off. This time around, I don't think that's going to be the case. In fact, I think a lot of the jobs that are most at threat from this revolution are university jobs, the more routine computer programming. We've already seen huge disruptions in the legal profession, in journalism, in doctors, all sorts of areas where jobs are being greatly reduced in, in, in quantity. Whereas I think the colleges and polytechnics are actually very well positioned because among the hardest jobs to automate out of existence are those that combine manual dexterity, combine applied work with a deep understanding. So things like plumbers, electricians, are gonna be much harder to automate than a computer programmer. 
The other big difference we see is we're starting from a much higher base of inequality. So whereas back in the nation at risk era, the gap between CEO pay and the average worker pay in the US was about 27 to one, that's gone up tenfold today. And we're seeing even sharper increases in equality in the rapidly developing economies like China and India. A third big difference we see is the difference in the profile of the workforce. So we heard yesterday from Stephen that Canada is facing a situation where going from four workers to every uh, retired person to two workers to every retired person. Well, Japan is in a far worse shape. They're about to go to close to one to one. And many of our advanced industrial economies, entire welfare state is premised on there being enough workers to pay for the retirement benefits of people as they're living longer and healthier lives. In the US, this data is pretty scary. Just this week, the government released the latest estimate that our retirement health care system, Medicare, has eight years of money left. 2026, we run out. I was hoping there would be a health care system for me when I retired. Now we have to worry about what does the demographics pose. So for the advanced industrial countries, our big worry is, are we going to have enough people to sustain our standard of living? For the planet as a whole, the challenge is just the reverse. So the poorest countries around the world are also those, as you know, that have the highest birth rates. And it's in areas like Africa and the Middle East that we're seeing huge surges in population growth, which are pro pro projected to take the world population to nine and a half billion people or more by 2050. The other big difference this time around, I would argue, is as scary as some of these trends can be, the biggest threat that we face as a society, as mankind, is not AI or robotics or other changes, but it's the impact that our own behavior, our own uses of technology are having on the global climate. Each day we put over 100 uh, million tons of CO2, of greenhouse gases, into the atmosphere. And what that has done is the graphs I'm sure all of you have seen, each year we hear about the hottest year on record, and that trend is certain to continue. We had the release this week of the IPCC report telling us that the clock is ticking even more so um, by 2030 if we don't take radical action, not just to reduce greenhouse gases, but also to find economic ways of capturing them and pulling them out of the atmosphere that we're facing going well beyond the 1.5 threshold that they, they warn will have really catastrophic consequences. No one is feeling this more than right here in Australia. You've suffered through record droughts, huge fires that those have precipitated. We're losing one of the world's great resources in the Great Barrier Reef thanks to the rises in ocean temperatures and acidification. And we see the effects of climate change happening all around the world and feeding global instability. So if you look at perhaps the biggest single source of refugees now across the planet in Syria, it was three record years of drought that forced more than five million people to leave their homes and move to the cities in Syria and then to seek refuge in other parts of the world. If you look across Africa, you see similar types of trends where people are no longer able to support themselves on the arid land that's been left and they're looking for ways to, to keep their families going. Here in this part of the world, the concern is not much further rises in sea level and whole islands, whole nations are going to be displaced and we're going to need to deal with those consequences. So as you put all of these trends together, I think we come up with two very contrasting futures for us to think about and prepare our students for. The one that we're heading down now, the, the path that we seem to be on, is the disintegration of the post-war consensus. Not so long ago, Francis Fukuyama wrote a very influential book, The End of History, saying that we had reached through democracy and through liberal free markets the pinnacle of where mankind's civilizations will evolve. But I would argue he was a little premature back in the 80s in making this pronouncement because what we seem to have had since is the end of the end of history move toward more authoritarian regimes, a disintegration of free trade, and a fa fear that technological change is not overall helping mankind, but furthering inequality in our societies. And when we ask questions like, why should it be that in the US where unemployment now is below 4%, at one of the lowest levels that we've ever recorded in the post-war era, why are so many people feeling 
disaffected, feeling like the economy is no longer for them. And I think the reason is because what we measure in our economic data doesn't reflect the new reality. So if you look at economists like Thomas Piketty and, uh, and Says and others, what you see in their work is they're saying, let's look at new ways of measuring the economy. So we have on the one hand our unemployment statistics, again at record lows, but if we look at the number of men in prime 25 to 54 working age, nearly 15% are not working even after a decade of sustained recovery. If we look at GDP growth, we see that while the overall economy has been growing substantially since 2000, 90%, 90% of the population has seen almost no benefits from that growth. And so they don't buy in. They don't see that these changes we're talking about are actually helping them. So up till now, I'm painting a pretty bleak future. But I would argue that there is an alternative future that is totally within our grasp, that takes a set of policies, a set of actions that are there for us to do now if we simply have the will, political and otherwise, to grasp them. Probably the simplest single thing we could do to make a big difference would be to institute a carbon tax. Tax those who are for the full cost of the emission of car carbon and the impact it's having on the planet and then give all of that money back to every citizen so that they have a basic income so if they lose their jobs in this disruption, they won't be uh, forced to, to go without health care or food. Diffuse the new forms of capitalism we see emerging that are not just about satisfying the shareholders of a company, but look for the overall stakeholder benefits. Things like benefit corporations or Mars Corporation, which is here in the convention center this week, and their interesting work on the economics of mutualism. I encourage you to look it up. Employee-owned firms, so that not just the top owners, but everyone in an enterprise benefits if you in introduce these productivity benefits. Venture philanthropy, which uses the best from the private sector, along with achieving key social goods and addressing our problems. We know that simple things like educating young women, if we were simply to invest and channel our aid in ensuring that young women across the world are given access to a good education, it would have huge benefits, proven benefits, in reducing poverty, introducing economic growth, and reducing population, which will be a key driver of the, the challenges we face for climate. Think about what we could do if we could tackle those two demographic challenges simultaneously. Move the people who are desperate to find a new way of life to the countries that actually desperately need more people if they're going to sustain their welfare states. And finally, huge economic opportunities. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to check out Paul, Hookins, Paul Hawkins' book, book, Downdraft, in which he looks at what are the solutions we could adopt, the 100 top solutions we could adopt to climate change that not only would save the planet, but create $30 trillion worth of economic value. So lots there on broad trends. What can we in higher education do to try to ensure that it's this brighter future and not the bleak one that we face as we go forward? So I wanted to point to just four areas where I think we can make a real difference. The first is right in our core business. How do we prepare informed citizens, workers, and leaders for this new economic reality? Well, what I would argue here is what we heard yesterday I totally agree with. General skills, the core foundation skills are going to become even more important. When we're not in a situation where we even know what many of the jobs will be in 10 or 20 years' time, we need to focus on preparing people with those things we know will enable them to succeed and adapt. Critical thinking, problem solving, cross-cultural communication, lifelong learning. I know these things are, can easily slip into rhetoric and that they're often very hard to do given the constraints on the way training funds are distributed, but I think they're absolutely crucial to look for ways to build if we're going to enable our students to succeed. On top of that, I think we need to focus on the 21st century competencies, what colleges and polytechnics are so good at, giving people a depth of technical skills so they get that first job, they interface with employers, they're able to stay on the cutting edge, building T-shaped people who have both the general breadth and the depth to be successful. We talk about the need for entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship, to be people who can seize these opportunities and innovate, but one thing we haven't talked much about is, in addition to digital fluency, I would argue media fluency. 
one of the things I see as the most disturbing trends for the students that we're educating today is their ability to discern between fake facts and real facts, their ability to carefully assess all of the huge amounts of information that they're bombarded with and not just to accept it from people that reinforce their own biases. I think enabling people to be a successful citizens as well as successful in the workplace will be crucial in this way. And finally, to prepare them with sustainability and resiliency, not just for all of these new industries that we will need to save the planet, but for their own resiliency, their own toughness to be able to deal with what will inevitably be major career changes and challenges in the decades to come. Well, the good news is I think there's a huge range of occupations that we're gonna continu continue to need to fill. In the high-end uh, university type uh, jobs, we see creatives, uh, artists, um, all sorts who are going to take advantage of new technologies as well as old uh, to, to generate new knowledges and new companies. We need systems integrators. What I think is so good in teaching sustainability is to solve these types of problems, you have to think broadly. You have to be able to, to, to bring together people from many different disciplines to solve and creatively manage uh, the, these projects. I think the middle skill level, as I've already said, will continue to be desperately important as we install more machines, as any of us who've had to deal with the IT department know, they break down. We're gonna need people who can fix them, who can keep them up to date, and who can continue to innovate. We're gonna need people who are able to do the huge construction projects we see here in Melbourne and others. At the lower skill level, I think our challenge is different. One of the things we know from demographics is that the caring professions are going to increase. It's gonna be important to all of us as we get older to have people who are able to look after us. Unfortunately, in most countries, those are treated as low-skilled occupations, low-paid occupations. We need to professionalize these, enable them to do their jobs effectively and with respect and dignity and a living wage. At Chatham, we've tried to grasp these new trends by int introducing new degrees in areas we think will have real resonance with today's labor market. So we've just one of the first to launch a new undergraduate de degree in virtual reality and augmented reality, not to move the technology forward, we're letting our colleagues at CMU do this, but to prepare people to take this technology and design compelling virtual worlds, to design effective training programs that really pull people in and are unable to build their skills up. And our data analytics degree is 100% employment rate because whatever sector you're in, you see that employers are demanding people who can analyze and present and communicate big data. I think a second key role for our institutions is to serve as the focal points for local high-skill ecosystems. One of the fun parts of my career was when I first developed the theory of high-skill ecosystems and then actually getting to see it adopted here in Australia, in Britain, in Sweden, and other parts of the world. And I think there's great opportunities here for our institutions to provide all of the key elements you need to have a thriving, successful industry cluster in your area to help generate the new innovations, applied innovations, new startups that fuel these clusters, to be the trainer of the people who will come out, both existing workforce and new graduates that are the nourishment they need to grow, to create a supportive environment where we have specialized equipment that these firms can't afford to buy themselves but that they can share, specialized consulting services and other technical assistance that can help them to grow and creating overall communities which are where today's knowledge workers want to be. Almost always those are in urban areas, near places with great thriving higher ed institutions that make for a richer life. And finally, to create that interdependence, the connectedness that pulls these different organizations, nonprofits, companies, government together to build thriving clusters. I think a third interesting opportunity, we've talked about the challenges of demographics, but they also create a huge opportunity. So if you ask me today, in today's economy, which is the group that has the most time, the most resources, and is least well served for education, I would say it's those who are over 50. How many colleges and universities around the world have made that their primary constituency to serve? Well, at Chatham, we're looking at this opportunity. What would it look like to build a college that was all about that? 
and we've benchmarked some of the leading examples of this in the US. So to give you just one, LaSalle College, very small college outside of Boston, in danger of going bankrupt. They were given a big piece of land next door. They said, we'll build it as a retirement community, but they couldn't get zoning permission. But they were allowed to build a dorm. So what did they do? They built a dorm, but the requirement to get in the dorm was that for the rest of your life, you were signing up as a full-time student. 450 hours a year until you're in your 90s. Now they counted everything, swimming, gardening, classes, field trips, but what they found was that it yielded remarkable benefits. So not only were people not isolated, they were interacting in a multi-generational community, they had higher satisfactions than had ever been seen in a retirement home, but they were also living longer and healthier because they were mentally and physically engaged. I think there are huge opportunities to think about building environments that leverage all of the talent in people who are living longer and healthier lives and getting them engaged in our institutions. And finally, none of all these other reforms are gonna matter if we can't come together, change our trajectory to save the planet. At Chatham, we've made sustainability our number one target. So we've built an entire new campus, nearly 400 acres, as the greenest in the US, all renewable energy, organic agriculture, even designed our own wetlands that processes the waste so the water leaves the campus cleaner than it comes down from the sky. That whole campus is designed as a, a living learning lab to show our students, our faculty, anyone who wants to visit, how can we build a more sustainable future. So I wanna conclude by leaving you with the words of our most famous alum from Chatham, Rachel Carson, whose book Silent Spring helped to create the modern environmental movement. To paraphrase Rachel, I won't read the whole quote. She says, we're at a key dividing point, a fork in the road. We can continue on the path we're now on, and while that's the easier option to do, we know where it ends. It ends in dramatic consequences, the decline of our global civilization. Or we can take the more difficult, the harder path, innovate, bring in renewable energies, bring in regenerative agriculture, look for innovations that will enable our kids and their kids to have a better future than we've had. So I, my charge to all of you is help us develop a whole new generation of Rachel Carsons. Let's partner, I, I'd look, love to look for ways to work together on solving these issues. Thank you very much. 